Well, good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Did you come expecting this morning? Yes. Well, so did I. When we were back there praying, uh, Pastor Todd said I, he's praying for a ring of word today. In other words, a word from God specifically for you to give you direction and purpose for your life. What do you think about that? Amen. Yeah, the Lord. Let's stand for a moment. You know, I walked into a, a mechanics shop this past week, and you know, I was looking around there, and I saw all these pieces of engines. I saw an engine, a carburetor, radiator, the, the exhaust system, all of that. You know what it reminded me of? The body of Christ. Oh, yeah. When we, you know, all during the week, we're scattered all over the place. <laughs> you know, one could be over in Florida and another one over in Ironwood, a couple over here, but we're all over. But on a Sunday morning, when we come together, it's like that engine. There was pieces all over the place. But when he got it assembled, that's a key word. When it's assembled, it runs. And you know what? We come here and we assemble together. And you know what I know? The Word of God says this. That where two or three of us are together, He's in our midst. You believe that? And where the presence of the Lord is, there is joy. Yes. Joy unspeakable yes. and full of glory and like uh, Robin just said, freedom. Yes. You bet where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty and freedom. Yes. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, when we come together here this morning, mm -hmm. and God, my heart's loaded with joy today. Yes. And Father, I praise you and I honor you. And Lord, as we worship you together, praise God, let us be that that good running engine where all the parts are assembled and we're assembled here for one purpose to glorify God in Jesus name Amen, Amen.
That's why I pray this morning that there would be some absolutes that would be here. The absolutes are that God inhabits and prays those people, so that's an absolute that God's here. That by his word, you're going to hear things today that are going to encourage you and build your faith up and strengthen you. That's an absolute. Because he's the way maker. Because he can work miracles on your behalf for you. Because that's his love for you. This morning, I want to pray for you. If you have a need today, if you just simply raise your hand, we're going to pray one for another. Amen. A lot of people have some needs. He's the miracle worker, isn't he? I've been watching him do that. And what an incredible thing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are moving and working. Thank you that there's nothing too difficult nor too hard for you. We praise you. We praise you that you promised that you would come and make yourself known to us. That you would inhabit praise in this place. And so we worship you and thank you, Lord. We declare that you, God, go before us and nothing's too difficult for you. Today, would you, God, begin to build faith in people? I pray against this issue of fear. We pray for and that we would be men and women that yes. live God your promises out. Yes. Even at times when we don't sense you or see you, yes. we're going to continue to believe that you are moving on our behalf. And you're working these things out for your glory. Yes. And so we worship you. Yes. We bless you, oh God. Yes. Because you are able to do beyond what we can even imagine. Would you surprise people? Yes, Lord. Surprise us with your grace, with your yes. mercy, with your goodness. It's new every day. Surprise people today with faith, God, that will move mountains. That will continue to believe even though it seems like it's impossible. So we trust you, Lord. We pray for miracles right now. We pray for those that are screaming with us right now. The presence of Jesus to fill homes right now. That you would, God, bring miracles upon miracles. And that we would see your hand evident in our lives. So we bless you, Lord. We pray for this area. We pray, God, protection over this area. We pray that, God, there will be no loss of life due to this sickness. We pray for people to begin to recover and be restored. We pray for Westgate right now, healing God into those rooms, Lord. We pray for our schools and our students and our teachers, Lord. We pray, God, overflow where there's so much uncertainty that you would show up as the Prince of Peace. We bless you and we praise you. We say yes to the kingdom of heaven. We say yes to your plans right now. We say yes to the future of this country. We say, oh God, that you would begin to call people out of the shadows and they would see your glory. God, your help. We pray for leaders right now that they would rise up in this country, that they would lead, first of all, loving you and then loving others. We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, for the confirmation hearings that will happen this week. We pray more to those things. We bless you and praise you, Lord. We pray for this own, this lady, Amy Coney Barrett, Lord, today. We bless her, Lord. We bless her family today. We pray that you would God strengthen her faith today. We worship you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 It's a good thing to pray, isn't it? Amen. Amen. It's a great thing to pray. Well, have a seat. We want to welcome you this morning. We're glad you're here. It's a little chilly out there, but Nick has not put the shorts away yet. <laughs> he makes me cold every time I look at him. I told him that this morning. We're glad you're here. Um, yeah, amen. We welcome you today. If you're visiting with us, we just bless you. We're glad you're a part. Um, oh. It's been a great week. Uh, pray for this area. Continue to just believe God for this area. That we would just see his presence show up in, 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 our, in our area. Um, I know that we've had kind of a rise in, in this uh, virus. And so we're praying for people. Um, just believing God is in the midst of us. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for, people are asking me, are you going to, uh, we're not canceling. So we're just going to continue to believe God. And he has protected this church. And so we're going to continue to do that. And uh, we want to be responsible. We pray for you. We pray protection over you. And this is a good place to be. Yes. And uh, I talked to one guy this morning, 6 o'clock in this morning, said I haven't been to church in months. He said I don't even know when the last time I drove by my church and there was a car there. He said, you're having, you're, you can't have it. I said, we are. We are just believing that God's protecting us and we're not being in, in any way um, arrogant or anything like that, but we're just believing this, that um, he 
he's, he's called us to assemble and he's called us to worship him. Yes. So amen. So I'm glad you're here today. Aren't you glad you're here? Yes. Yes. And I'm glad you have, you're here live streaming with us today. Thank you for live streaming with us. Thank you for those. We, um, we are just, I'm overwhelmed with the outreach of this church, with our radio stations. Um, and I hear every week from people that listen on radio to us um, and what God's doing. And we have people right now that are connecting and joining us, partnering with us financially, whether it's on the live stream or radio or here. And I tell you, this church is moving ahead. And we're believing that this is not a time to shrink back, but this is a time to rise up. And so I just see this more and more where people are saying, you know what, we're believing God. And so in these weeks to come, let's continue to pull together. Let's continue to be one in Christ. And like Pastor Roy gave that great illustration about that motor, um, how it's assembled together. And because it's assembled, there's authority, there's power there. And so let's continue to do that. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to, um, in a moment here, um, we get to do something that uh, is just one of the, probably the greatest joys that I can be a part of. And it's going to be uh, dedicating uh, our little grandson, uh, Trevor and Julie's little grandson, and uh, Caleb and Kelsey, uh, the little boy Jack, Jack Robert. So, uh, you know, it was uh, 26 years ago at this church. This church had only been formed two or three, about three months at that point, four months. And we dedicated Caleb here. And uh, so, uh, and it was, remember, some of you remember Ron Smith. And uh, Ron Smith would play the keyboard, and uh, he was a band teacher all those years. He moved up here from, I think, Alpena, somewhere down there. And uh, he was just a blessing to this church. And so he wrote a song to Caleb that day. And so I was looking through my uh, thing about just the promises of God that he wrote, and he just played that song for Caleb. And I'll never forget what a blessing that was. And so I was looking through some of my, because I have, a, uh, in, my, in my office is uh, on my left side, is, oh, there it is, Rob. You're sitting right on there. Okay. okay. I was wondering where it was. There we go. Um, I have a couple files that I keep some keepsakes in. And uh, I can tell you that they are becoming more and more valuable the, uh, the longer they're there. And so uh, I was looking through some of them. Um, here's a picture from 1998. Uh, and uh, it's a picture that was in the newspaper. And I hope, I probably can't see it very well. I should have put it up on the screen. There's Caleb, and he's a little shepherd. And then Molly Riley's between them. And then Kelsey is an angel. <laughs> and so, uh, and Caleb found an angel when he found Kelsey. So, uh, yeah, what a, what a blessing. I was looking through, and I thought, wow, isn't that good? So many years later, God's faithfulness is good, isn't it? Yes. And so I'm excited about um, our little grandson, Jack. Now, if, if Jack is not very artistic, it's because of Caleb. <laughs> so <laughs> that was one of his drawings he gave me um, one day. And so uh, he'd come to my office, and uh, uh, he'd be under my desk, and we'd be glad that didn't transfer on. <laughs> there and he'd be gone. He'd get on my typewriter and he'd write things on, his, on my typewriter. Cause I used to, how many of you remember a typewriter? Those were, you got to change the ribbons out in them and white out and all those things. It, he writes here, Caleb Winkler is a good boy. <laughs> and then he wrote, um, frogs grin. So he had a thing with frogs. One day he came in and he said, Dad, do frogs bite? And he had a thing with catching them and bringing them home. So uh, he wanted to make sure he wasn't going to get hit by one. Even though, even though they smile, he, he wanted to make sure. Um, and uh, yeah, what a good thing. Uh, Caleb is a good boy, and Kelsey's a wonderful, wonderful young lady. And it's been a gift to see them now have little Jack. And so would you guys come and bring Jack and Trevor and Julie? Would you come and Robin? And so we're going to dedicate them. Um, somebody's going to take some pictures here. Robin's got a camera ready. So would you guys come on up? Would you welcome them as they come?
looking at. He's got a thing with lights and fans. So, yeah. His name is Jack Robert, and uh, Jack means this, the graciousness of God. And Robert means a shining fame. And I just believe that about him. That um, Jack is, you know, in the Middle Ages, that um, the name Jack was the most popular name. And it actually came, became synonymous with man. That he's a man. When they'd say Jack, they would mean that's a man. And I believe that about him. That he is going to be a wonderful man. He's going to be a wonderful man that leads well. He's going to be a man that loves well. He is going to be a man that leads more, leaves more of a legacy than just possessions or things. But he will leave a legacy of an example of a young man that loves Jesus. And so we're going to pray for him. Pray for Kelsey and Caleb. Thank you. Thank you that you know how to give good gifts. Thank you that I'm reminded of your graciousness in Jack. I'm reminded of your mercies in Jack. Thank you, Lord. What a treasure. And God, I pray for this young man. I pray for Caleb and Kelsey today. Thank you that the favor of the Father is upon them. It always has been. Even when they were little kids sitting in the front row. Thank you for Kelsey. Help her. I will praise you for the wonderful mom she is to this little guy. Thank you for the wonderful wife she is to Caleb. We bless her, Jesus. Thank you for Caleb. Thank you that he's a hard worker. Thank you that he loves his wife and he loves his boy. I pray that as they love you, they would, God, teach this young boy to depend on you completely and totally. And so we trust you. We pray for Jack that he's going to love well and he's going to lead well. That God is going to rise up and God, he is going to, not going to be a follower, but he's going to be a leader. And so we pronounce God your blessings over him. Praise you. Praise you. Praise you for um, two marriages, mine and Trevor and Julie's, that have been examples to these two. We bless their marriage. We bless their kids to come that uh, they would be wealthy beyond measure, like we are. And uh, we trust you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He's the jack and good guy. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go, back to your daddy. <laughs> oh, all right. You guys can be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie Carter, for coming. To the next generation, and uh, Tom, that's what I'm going to teach you. About. Julie's granddaughter's here today too. So oh, she, yeah. She, okay. She would like her dedicated. Oh man, what a great surprise! All right, Cody. Uh, is that right, Cody? You guys want to dedicate your little girl? All right. Well, nothing like a surprise for a couple, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, come on up here. Yeah. I met them a couple weeks ago, and Cody gave his life to Christ. Amen. The day his mom. Sandra and Bob, you're two wonderful examples. Would you guys come and stand with them? Let's pray together with this couple. Oh, Cody, good to see you, man. You promised me. Thank God for you. Yeah. Tell me your name. Nikki. And what's her name? Meadow. Meadow. Can I hold you, Meadow? Can I come and hold you? No, uh, that's not. <laughs> Can I hold you? Oh, here. Let me. Oh, yeah. Oh, Meadow. Probably you come. Oh, oh. <laughs> she just acts like my granddaughter. <laughs> oh, all right. 
we want to pray for you, Cody and Nikki, and we want to pray for little Meadow. Mm. What a good thing. Thank you for a great grandma that loves her little great granddaughter, Meadow. Mm. You guys need help with Jesus, don't you, to raise her? That's what we all need, don't we? Well, I'm so blessed by you guys. We've been through a lot these last couple weeks with the death of Cody's mom and now him providing a home for his younger siblings. Isn't that a good example of a man? Yes. He's out working. And Nikki. So we're going to pray for you guys, okay? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful couple. I've never had anybody choke on you when I pray for I wish you'd brought me one, Cody. I'm feeling a little bit hungry. All right. Father, praise you. Praise you for this couple. Praise you for the little girl. Praise you that, God, even in the midst of difficult difficulties, you go with them and you bless them. And so we pray for this little girl with Meadow that she would experience, Jesus, all your promises, all your plans for her life. Bless her in ways that she couldn't even imagine. I pray for Cody today, God. Thank you for this man. Feels like he's got more on his shoulders than he can, but thank you that you are his burden bearer. Thank you that he's committed his life to you, Jesus. Thank you that you, God, can give him the strength he needs to walk the way you've called him to. I pray for Nikki. Thank you for a wife that will stand next to her husband through difficult days. And so we pray that you would bless her today. Give her continued strength, God. Help her to be able to do some things like uh, even with this little baby and her new baby. We just try to pray blessings over that, yes, Jesus. Yes. And um, Lord, I pray for the home, that you would just fill it with the peace of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Daddy. surprises like that? Yeah. <laughs> I do. Oh, I can never forget just how good God has been. And uh, yeah, um, a couple weeks ago, I, I know Cody won't mind me telling you this, uh, we were doing the funeral for his mom, unexpectedly died. And I'd never met Cody before. And um, I saw him out here and we were just kind of getting ready and then he walked in my office and he just was just real transparent with me. He said, I, I have more on my plate than I can handle right now. And, uh, and he started breaking down. And I said, man, let me pray for you. And then I shared with him Jesus. And he said, oh, wow. That's the miraculous love of God, isn't it? Yes. Yes. That he shows up when you feel like you have more on your plate or you feel like you're at the end of the road. That he shows up and he just moves. And uh, it was just one of those times that I'll never forget the goodness of God showing up. Surprises. Wonderful surprises. He shows up when no one else shows up. Isn't that something? Here's one of my favorite, one of my favorite thoughts. Is he, he always is looking for the entrance. He never looks for the exit. He always comes where we need him. And so what a good word. Amen. It was one I want to teach today about the greatness in the kingdom of God and how great it is to see God's miraculous power and we witness it. We witness it when Jesus says this, the greatness to the kingdom. So, amen. Well, I didn't forget to take an offering. Some of you were like, hey, hey, stop right now. You're out of order. <laughs> Um, we do this pastor's thing uh, at, once a year round, and I go and do this pastor's thing for a ministry called Room Tree. And so we facilitate it. And one of the nights we sit around the uh, table and we say, could you tell us funny stories that have happened in your ministry? And, uh, and, and, and I just keep the, because here's what I found out. There are way too many of us that live way too, just one guy said, what, so what's the funny story? He said, one time, I forgot to take the offering. I said, oh, really? That's it? I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, wow, okay. That's, that's the funniest. I said, this last one we were at, I told the story about the many, I was talking about Christmas plays. And many of you remember we did a, a Christmas uh, play called In Bethlehem Inn. And it was actually a dinner theater. And uh, one year we did it at the uh, St. Sebastian Gym. 
And so we did this whole thing and everyone dressed up and it was this big production and people ate and it was like you were at an inn in Bethlehem. We should do it again. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so we did it the first, the first year we were here in this building, we did it right here. We set up tables, had a great time. Anyway, we were at the gym and we set up this uh, sign that said, In Bethlehem Inn, and it was so windy we had nothing to keep it in place because it kept flipping over. So I went and grabbed a, a gallon of white paint out of the basement of the church building and put it up on the sign. And I didn't know it, but the sign flipped over during the play, and the priest was mad as you wouldn't, he was just so angry with me. So he's there, and he's telling me, you've got white paint all over my sidewalk, and I want it cleaned up right now. And I'm like, oh no. And then he, he just, and then Caleb and Jonah Ritzler run up to me and say, because we had a live nativity right outside in the, by the sidewalk. And Caleb said to me, Dad, the donkey's dead. <laughs> I, said, I said, what? He said, the donkey's dead. And so I said, no, you can't be kidding me. We had Travis Hollenbrecht brought his dad's donkey to church. And then, so I run out there, and sure enough, the donkey's laid out on the sidewalk like this. I'm like, oh man, what did you guys do? So there's, a, there's a big, big puddle of paint right here, and a dead donkey about 20 minutes. <laughs> I said, wow. No one taught me this at college. You know? I said, what did you guys do? I don't know, we were just kind of playing with it. All of a sudden it got stiff and went over. <laughs> So I'm, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get the paint cleaned up and I gotta get a dead donkey on the side. <laughs> so uh, Travis came, thankfully came up to me and he goes, Pastor, don't worry. He said, don't worry, my, my dad's donkey, it, it, it faints when it gets overstimulated. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good thing to tell somebody before you <laughs> volunteer them the donkey. <laughs> so. Uh, so I didn't forget the offering. So, um, all right, guys, come on up, and uh, we'll take the offering. Father, praise you for a good day. Praise you for God, good things. Praise you for wonderful promises and new life. And thank you, oh, God, we thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you that, God, you've done beyond what we could even imagine because you've been so good to us. So we just love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 The apartment has a story that touches all the bases. Here's tonight's On the Road. Thank you. A couple weeks ago, Brian Robinson and his son Carter were at this batting cage in Montgomery, Alabama, when a random stranger threw him a high hard one to the heart. There was this bucket of balls with a note. The note read, hope someone can use some of these baseballs. I pitched them to my son and grandson for countless rounds. The writer went on to say that his family is now grown and gone, but what he would give to pitch a couple of buckets to them. If you are a father, cherish these times. Brian and his wife Stormy read that note with tears in their eyes. It felt like it, it like a moment for us. It still does. It does. We need to soak in more of our kids and time with our kids. Just the message the author intended. I was just hoping it would inspire some people. Randy Long used to love watching and coaching his kids. So much so that when he came across that old bucket of balls in his garage, he couldn't bring himself to just throw away the memories. He says he needed closure. It was like a goodbye, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was a sign off, a sign off type thing. Uh, okay, I think that chapter is gone. Well, uh, let's see what else, you know, what else is coming on. But unbeknownst to Randy, his baseball days were headed into extra innings. This week, he met the Robinsons at a local park yeah. where Randy learned about a void in Carter's life. The boy lost both his grandfathers at a very young age. They never saw him play. We love you. Oh, I was going to say, I'm love for you. Love for you. Love for you. Randy said he'd definitely be at the next game and then asked Carter for a little catch. Right, we're headed. Did you see the smile on my face, Carter? <laughs> this is bring back memories. Seems now Iowa isn't the only state. Top it with a field of dreams. <laughs> okay. It's what I've always wanted for him. I'm sure a lot of people across the country now 
are realizing that's not just a bucket of balls anymore. No. It's a fountain of youth and a binding force for generations. Steve Harper, CBS News, on the road. Great reminder, if we release our kids, they're heading downstairs or across the parking lot to our youth building. Well, take your Bibles with me. We're going to Matthew chapter 18. So many of you know that we've been in this series for some time now called Recalibration. And recalibration means when things are off course, you recalibrate to get them back on the course. And I believe that many of us are in this place of recalibration, where things are maybe weren't a priority, we're making them a priority now. Where we sense and know that this is a season and this is a time we're living in, that these things are not optional for us, that we must make them priorities that we might step into the days that come for us and say, we know these are stable places that we planted our lives, our families. And so we've been talking about the kingdom and, and the main verse we've been going on is seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. When we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he said he's gonna surround us and add all these other things to our lives. So let me take a break for one minute. Alvin, would you let that couple know that we have an upstairs for them where they can take a little meadow? Thank you. So we're going to look this morning at Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to start in verse 1. And what's happened is you'll read it in another gospel, but what's taking place is these disciples are looking at Jesus and they're trying to figure this thing out. It's kind of like what we're doing right now. We're trying to figure out some things that we are looking at that maybe are surrounded with some confusion, maybe some things are out of order. And so these disciples are looking to Jesus and they want to know because in our world, everything goes by this. Who's the greatest? Who's the most important? Who has the most? Who is the most intelligent? Or all these different things to gear toward who is the most important? Who is the greatest? And so an argument has erupted with the disciples and they can't, they're, they're arguing about their place, their importance. And so what Jesus does is he goes on to teach and he teaches them who is the greatest in the kingdom. And so that is what in the next few minutes we want to look at. Who is the greatest in this kingdom? This kingdom that Christ has called us to step into. And so we're going to start reading in verse 1. We'll put it up on the screen for you if you've not brought your Bibles. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he's put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like a child, or like, a ch like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. How many know Jesus takes this pretty serious? Is there... Any argument that Jesus looks at these things and says, these are the things that matter. These are the things that are not open for argument. These are the things that if you want to step into the kingdom, you begin to understand these things. And so what's happened is these disciples have came, come to him and they don't even, they're not even, it's not even on the radar that there's a child in their midst. But it is to Jesus. And so what does he do? He takes this little child, isn't it what it says in verse 3? And he says to them, Because a child, I believe this, is created in the image of God. Created in the very essence of who God is. 
And he begins to articulate some things about children. That child was willing to come to him, trust him. That child was willing to humble himself and be put in the midst of this audience of all these older people that are looking at them. Those are two attributes that Jesus says are necessary for you and I. That we're willing to come to him. That we're willing to humble ourselves. That we're not living in a place of arrogance or pride. So he invites them to come. Entrance into the kingdom is available to those who will come when they're invited. It's pretty simple. In verse 4 or verse 3, I say to you, unless you turn and become like this child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> when we experience the kingdom of heaven, it's one of what? Peace and joy. We're all children. Think of this. Although we're at different stages in our lives, we're still all children, aren't we? And it doesn't matter when we come, but if we come. And this man that lives up the road here, and he has for many years, and I don't know how I met him, but I met him many, many years ago. And every once in a while, every probably maybe six months, maybe it's a couple years, he, he won't show up, and then all of a sudden he'll show up and he'll walk into my office. And he'll say, hey, Pastor, you got a minute? And I said, sure, come on, sit down. And so we talk. A week ago, last Wednesday, he did that. He's in the midst of transition. He's retired now and has a very successful career, but he's retired now and he's selling everything. He's selling everything because him and his wife are going on an adventure. But he came to my office because he had some things that he was kind of troubled about. Some of the things that he sees taking place in our country. Some of the things that he sees that he's afraid of that are going to happen in the future. And so we go Wednesday, I had a chance to sit with him for a few minutes and just share with him the simple message of Jesus, how he comes to take burdens that we weren't called to carry. And when we're willing to come to him, he'll never, he'll never reject us. Doesn't matter where we've been, or what we've done, he's never going to reject us. And so that morning, he prayed a simple prayer. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, would you fill me with your presence? Amen. And he walked out of my office. Well, last Wednesday, he walked back in. He said, we're all packed up, almost anyway. I said, you need any help? He said, no, don't need any help. Everything's set to go. He said, I have to tell you something. He said, last Wednesday, when I walked into your office, something changed. He said, I don't know how to explain it, and I can't even give you the words to explain it, but it's like my life has made a 180 degree change. And he said, all of a sudden, and he said, you'll never guess this dream I had this morning. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, I had this dream. And all of a sudden, I realized some things were happening that were so quickly in my life. And then he said, I heard these words as soon as I woke up. Jesus said to me, I have the wheel. Don't worry about it. Isn't that a good thing? He said, Pastor, I said, that's a great thing. I have the wheel. Don't worry about it. No matter when you come, whether you're in your late 60s or you're at six, whenever you come, when Jesus invites you to come, he says, oh, come, experience me, experience what I promised for you. That's the good news of the gospel, that this thing hasn't changed and that God's word is still going forth like it is today. And so wherever you're at, whatever you need, he says, I am here and I'm available. And that message is. We must continue to share with people because they're walking through difficult days. I said, would you let me pray with you before you leave? He said, sure. He said, we're on the road now. We're, we're heading out, him and his wife. I thought, what a great thing. When he walked out of my door, he run, didn't walk out of a, as a guy in his late 60s. He walked out as a, as a boy that was looking for the next greatest adventure. Yeah. And that's what I prayed for him. Isn't life supposed to be adventure? Yes. Where God opens up doors for you and says, I want you to enjoy life. Don't you like hanging around kids because they not enjoy life, don't they? Yeah. They, don't, they don't worry about things that we at times worry about. But they not enjoy. And what did Jesus say? When you become like a little child, you begin to enjoy life. Let me read this letter to you. It's a letter from a young man that walked into this church about a year and a half ago. 
Robin and I used to go and watch him run that track and could he run? We would pray for him. He didn't know it, but we were. Because we saw such wonderful potential in this young man. I met you here two weeks ago on Monday. But here's where he left at my desk when I got on Tuesday. He said, I want to thank. He said, Dear Pastor Robin and Todd, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> She's a chief of a lot. She's a good and wonderful pastor. I want to thank you and everyone at Cornerstone. Most of all, I want to thank God for sending me to Cornerstone. At Cornerstone, a window was opened for me to see and feel the overwhelming presence of God. Here's what he said. Listen to this. It led me to forgive and forget and to turn away from sin. Change my attitude from being one that I was bitter and angry to one of happiness and joy. I trust God he will provide me on this new part of my life, on my journey, because of you, because of this church. Did you see that? He changed from an attitude of being bitter and angry to one of, what did he say? Happiness and joy. Is that not the essence of what Jesus said? When he said, I want you to become like a child. I read that letter and I sent him a text. I said, I'm praying for you this morning. In a matter of just a couple seconds, he sent me back another text. You know what he sent me? A picture of a mountain he was ready to climb in Montana. A mountain. I was working, doing some work over here in the house and the keystone in the garage. My phone went off again. I opened it up later in the afternoon. Just got off the mountain. What an experience. God wants you and I to be on an adventure. He wants us to leave the bitterness and anger behind. He wants us to experience the joy and the happiness that he's promised us. And when Jesus said, this is what matters. See, in our world right now, guys, listen to me. In our world right now, we're getting way too caught up with everything swirling around us that we forget about what the greatest in the kingdom is. Right. And that is that we become children that say, God, I don't know what's ahead, but I'm trusting you that you're ahead of me, and this thing's going to go work out for my good because, God, you're with me. Yes. Can you say none of that? Because yeah. that's, the, that's the essence of where we're at. And so whatever you're facing today, whatever you're going through, let me remind you of just the simple invitation of Jesus makes. He said, if you're willing to humble yourself, if you're willing to come, then you're going to be experiencing the joy that comes, the happiness that comes when you enter into the kingdom. Because you'll be the greatest. It comes with a promise, but it comes with a warning. In verse 5, there's a transition, transition that takes place. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. That is a wonderful promise. Could you put that? There we go. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. That, I cannot underestimate the importance of that scripture. Whoever receives one of these little children receives me. Is it important that we value children? Yes. I mean, I don't believe there's anything more important than us valuing and honoring children. I sat with a young couple this last week that are being they're just becoming a part of Cornerstone. And they said, Tell you, can you tell us our, your vision of Cornerstone? I said it's real simple. We're called to love Christ and to be examples to this next generation and to love children and to minister to kids. It's no small thing. It's no small thing that, that you guys give consistently so that we can provide a meal every week here for about 70 to 80 kids. They packed that, that uh, um, youth building. There was only a couple chairs that were empty. Kids inviting other kids, picking up busloads of kids to bring them here to bless them and to value them 
And you know what was so good for me last week is there was just a, a real, and we prayed for this, that there would be a place of peace and, and calmness here. And so we set up all these round tables and we asked kids to sit at a round table. And then Robin has a question for them each week. Here was the question we had for them this last week. If you were given a $100 gift card, what store would you go to and what would you buy? One little girl came up to me, just she just gotten a brownie. Some of you guys make brownies every week to give out to these kids and cookies. She just received a little brownie and she said, Pastor Todd, you know what I do? And I said, no, what would you do? She said, well, I buy my family. She was talking about buying them gifts. And then she said, I give the rest to the church. <laughs> I said, that's great. Or you could take me to Dunham's and buy me some ammunition. Um, no, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. That was my thought, but I didn't. But what a thing that we can bless kids. Jesus said that if you receive one of these children, you receive me. In a world that says they don't matter. In a world that says they're not that important. We need to value this next generation. Here's the problem, because if you destroy this next generation, you destroy this nation. You destroy this society. The promise is that when you protect and provide for the least of these, because when Jesus talks about a child, he talks about someone that cannot provide for themselves and that cannot protect themselves. And when you do that, Heaven will take notice. The Father in heaven will take notice when you do things that will provide and protect for the most needy, the most vulnerable. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says this is what's going to happen in the end. Here's what's going to come down. Here's how it's all going to work out in the end. He gives us a glimpse of how things are going to happen. Here's what he says in verse 31 of chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him. Can you imagine that now? Now, there's a lot of angels in heaven, aren't there? Yeah. And he says all of them are with him. I mean, that's got to be quite the multitude. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Is there a kingdom? There certainly is. There is a kingdom because he talks about it all the time. And he will, before all the nations are gathered for him, he will separate like a shepherd goats from the sheep. And to the rose on the right, the king will declare, Come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom. There's that word again. Kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and they were perplexed. And they said, why? Why can we enter the kingdom? Why do we have access into the kingdom? And you know what he said? Because you are a family. And you do what families do for one another. You say, I don't remember reading that in the gospel. Pastor, I don't remember reading that in Matthew 25. No, maybe you didn't read it as I put it there, but it's exactly what he said. When you're a part of a family and you do as families do for one another. When you're a part of a family and you do for, because then he went on to say, he said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me some water. I was sick and you came to visit me. I was in prison and you came to see me. You did it for them, but you were doing it for me. Isn't it go with what Jesus taught us? When you receive a little child, when you, see, you receive someone that cannot provide for themselves, cannot protect themselves, are the most vulnerable of our society, and you do something for them, heaven will take notice of you, and there will be a reward. I'm going to talk about kingdom rewards in the next couple of weeks, and boy, you won't want to miss that message, because some people say, well, I don't know about a reward. There is a reward waiting for those that walk in the kingdom, and the reward is something that we can experience right now, but I'm telling you what, there's scriptural evidence that talks about a reward that's waiting for you and I. But heaven will take notice when you do things. And what Jesus is saying right here is he said, these things didn't pass my folk. I, I, was, I, I saw what you did. I watched it. Because you did it to the, you acted like a family. You did for others what they couldn't do for themselves. They couldn't provide for themselves and you did it for them. Now that's a wonderful promise, isn't it? But I don't believe there's ever a place where Jesus makes a promise to us that he does not give us a warning also. Because here's a warning, and I don't think we can make light of it one bit. Because in this warning, what does he say? 
He said, but whoever in verse 6 causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. As he pays attention, when you bless children, when you bless the most vulnerable, hear me, he takes notice when we misuse or abuse those that are the most vulnerable, those that cannot provide themselves nor protect themselves. He takes notice of these things. Do you think that it was, it's just a coincidence of all these things that justice or soon to be Justice Amy Coney Bear has experienced. Do you think that that's just a coincidence? And they will say many times, and I don't want to become political here, but I need to say this. Because here's where we're at as a society. We have forgotten to cherish children. We have forgotten to cherish the most vulnerable in our society. And it starts in the womb. They might say that this opposition is because of health care issues, but I would have to say that it's more concerned about their fear of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Amen. I like what Mother Teresa said. Let me paraphrase. She said, when a nation will kill their own babies, their own children, there's no limit to what they will do. We must cherish children. I am thankful that there's forgiveness for those that have harmed children in any way, but I praise God that he says, I don't, I don't take this thing lightly. Because why? It destroys the very fabric of a society. It destroys everything that God has created us. When we understand this, that we were created in the very image of who God is. There has been an attack on the family in this nation like never before. Because if you can destroy a family, if you can destroy a, a husband and a wife that will raise up their children, why is it that right now, I believe this, that why is it right now that we are facing such chaos in many parts of our city? Because we've abandoned the family structure. We've abandoned the nucleus. We have not raised up children and we've not cherished them and valued them. Are you not alarmed with what we see with the sex trade, child sex trade? I mean, that, like, I didn't come to church today, the pastor, to hear about those things. I challenge us that we must be people that will do everything we can to protect children and pray and ask God for help and ask God to reveal things, that he'll uncover things, that things will be exposed that are harming children, that whole ideologies will be exposed that are harming child, children. Several weeks ago when BLM became a very common name, Black Lives Matter, it's an organization. And hear me, you might be offended with me and I'll risk it. But that organization has nothing to do with bringing unity to races. We're all one race because we're all the human race, aren't we? That's right. And this organization, if you will, here it's been taken down. They had a 21-point manifesto that was linked to their website. I went on in early August because I started to hear about this organization. You know what I was so alarmed with? In point, I think it was either three or four. Their manifesto declares that they are out to eradicate the Western nuclear family. To disassemble it. I am not exaggerating. You say, well, what does that really mean, the Western nuclear family? A nuclear family is defined as this. A husband and a wife that have dependent children and raise them in a home. That's the, and that is not a Western family. That is a worldwide family. Because that's the way that God inst instructed it to be. That's the way that God designed it to be. 
I praise God for today that we have two couples that are committed to one another and committed to raising their children. That gives me such assurance and such hope because it goes back to what God instructed. But think of what takes place when you can divide the family, you can destroy the family. We see that when sin entered in the garden, remember when sin entered in the garden? Remember what Adam did? He first of all blamed and then he excused his behavior and then he became a victim. He blamed his behavior on someone else. He excused his behavior and then he became a victim. I think that all too often that men have done that. We blame someone else. We've excused what we've done. You think about it. And then we abandon it. Well, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a victim of circumstances. It comes to a point where we have to say that created us to live in this environment where he said, I want children to be raised in this environment. Well, look at the destruction that took place in that first family between Cain and, Cain and Abel, two brothers. Think of the incredible pain of two parents. One of your sons has been murdered, the other is a murderer. You think of the enemy, did he not come in to destroy families? And now we hear this organization, when we will dismantle a family, we will open it up to chaos. Terrible, terrible pain. I see that in family after family, where we see such devastation taking place, and we think that it's a small thing. Hear me, it opens up children to be vulnerable. I have concerns every Wednesday night when I drop these kids off. I pray for them. There's one little girl I'll open the door for her and she'll say, Pastor Ty, thanks for giving me a ride today. And then I see her take and run for her front door and I'm not sure what she's gonna experience when she opens that door. I've known this family for many years. We need to pray, pray, pray for God to protect these children and for this church to be an avenue where people can come and experience the hope of Christ and begin to experience some real purpose for their marriage, for their lives, for their children, for their families, yes. and begin to raise them up and say, we're going to protect kids. We're going to honor kids. We're going to bless kids. Because isn't that where the wealth is? Isn't that where the wealth is? Yeah. Some of my family posted some pictures the last couple days. Did the funeral for my uncle here a few weeks ago. They're loading up trucks and trailers and cars and everything you can imagine, all of this stuff. Hauling it to an auction and they posted pictures. Praise God that my uncle had a dream about three weeks ago, three weeks before he died. And in this dream, he tells me that it wasn't a dream. He was actually at home, and although he was not at home, he was in Marshfield Hospital. He said, I was home, and you came to see me, and you prayed for me. God did something radical in three weeks, but I can tell you this. When I did his funeral, I can tell you that if he would have protected that family, it would have been a whole different funeral than the one I was at. Our wealth is not measured by what they haul away when we die. Measured by what they haul away when we die. The measure of our wealth is by this relationship that we have with the Father in heaven who says, I love you and I have a plan for you. And it's this relationship that we have with one another and it starts with our family. And it starts when you say, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. And even though it's not easy, even though I don't like to get up in the morning to do what you've called me to do, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it because somebody's depending on me. You are willing to receive children. You are willing to, willing to receive the most vulnerable. And now you are blessed. You are blessed. It's not about things, is it? about what God's called you to and then he says I want to pour out a blessing on you I have 
Watch this church is getting blessings after blessings. They're not financial, they're kids. This letter right here, you couldn't pay me enough for that letter. Because it makes me wealthy. It makes you and I wealthy. Because it's defined by what kingdom matters. The things that matter for kingdom. I was thinking this last week, um, last Sunday we had Rachel and Joel and little Evie and Gil and Kelsey came over and little Jack. And it was just an incredible Sunday. Um, then we went out and shot guns. It was incredible. <laughs> it was great. Man, we enjoyed ourselves. I was looking at this, uh, Robin has in her dining room, she's got this right there on, it's like a, a register. I got that signed for Christmas last year. And uh, it's a piece of wood that Kelsey made. It's got some white lettering on it. Out of all the gifts I got last year for Christmas, and I got some great gifts. I was looking to get some headphones so when I sit in my purse shed, I don't have to hear the mice run ahead of me. I was ready to buy a $30 pair and they bought me a pair of Beats. Your pastor listens to Beats. <laughs> you, know, you don't know what Beats are, you don't know what music is. <laughs> Sometimes, kid would scare the life out of me because I was listening one day to keep me. That's not good. Um, I could be home to heaven right now if my heart went bad. <laughs> I got some great gifts. I got a Milwaukee M18 tool, multi-purpose tool. I've used it many times. I got some great gifts. Stuff so expensive I wouldn't have bought it. But there was nothing more valuable to me than this little sign that Kelsey made. And it said this. Family. And when I opened that up, I said, quite some time because it meant so much to me because is not this true that family is the greatest treasure that God gives us and he calls this church a family of believers and then he gives us wonderful gifts that we say wow you just incredibly the treasures you've given me I'm concerned at times for people they live their whole lives, they value worthless things. Hear me, let's be wise people. Let's value what's valuable. And a lot of them just left here a few minutes ago. They're the valuable ones. They're the ones we show up for. They're the ones we invest in. They're the ones that we pray for. They're the ones that we do say, hey, whatever happens, they're gonna find a place that's why I so am blessed by this body of believers. 26 years ago, I can stand here again and pray, bless my grandson. A lot of guys, I'm telling you, I'm praying, but man, I'm telling you, the favor of God, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. Don't we want more of his kingdom? Yeah. Then let's value the greatest in his kingdom. Why don't you stand with me? I just want you to bow your heads, and here's what I'm praying right now. If there's anything out of order, and there's anything out of the line, that God, by His Holy Spirit, will bring a recalibration, and that He will begin to remind you, He will reward you for the things that you've done. How many? I just want to pray that you'd be reminded of the wonderful things in the past where you've just poured into kids and you've poured into lives, all these years that we've done camps, all these things that we've done for kids, all the people that we've watched walk through and we've blessed them and we've prayed for them. And then if there's anything that you need to hear, that. So we just bless you today, Lord. We just thank you that you May we be reminded of what Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We bless you for all the ways that we've loved on kids and shown favor to kids in this church. And I pray for those that they need to be kids today. They need to be just leave the anger and the bitterness behind like this young man wrote. And they'll experience some joy and their happiness. So I pray that especially for someone here today. That what you carried in with anger and bitterness is not going to be what you carried out. 
but he's going to give you a gift of joy and it will be your strength this week because you're willing to say, I release, I release those who have wronged me, those who have offended me, those who have done terrible things to me. I release them right now in the name of Jesus. That simple prayer. I release them. I forgive them in the name of Jesus. There's going to be freedom for you this week that you've never known. Praise you for that, Lord. So we leave those things behind, and so we step into God what you value this week. And so we bless you and we praise you, Jesus. So we say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth, in our lives, in our families, in the heavens. How many agree with that prayer? Say amen. 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 Well, God bless you. If you need prayer this morning, come. We'll pray together. Isn't it good to be here? Yes. Yeah. Church is a great place to be on a Sunday. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Good afternoon.